our full iPhone 10 review. I want to first preface this review by saying that I own a 5K iMac, a 13 inch MacBook Pro, a Series 3 Apple Watch, now the iPhone 10, amongst a multitude of Apple TVs. It's hard to believe that the iPhone 10 has been out for just about a month. And these are my thoughts of what works and what doesn't work with the iPhone 10 in a more college centric workflow of me going to class, being a content creation major and how that this phone fits into my life. First off, Face ID works. Face ID works fast and it works accurately. The only problems I've had with Face ID have been in direct sunlight while wearing sunglasses. Sometimes the IR light from the IR blaster doesn't get through the sunglasses and it causes it to not unlock your phone. But in all other instances, whether it be in the dark, in the bright sunlight, equal distances from my face, I haven't really noticed an issue with it. Face ID is a really nice way to do purchases and autofill passwords. For example, if you're on a website and a password field pops up, Face ID will automatically scan your face and input that password for the given site. The technology also works well when doing Apple Pay. You just tap, double tap the side button, it scans your face, you hold your phone down to the reader, and boom, instant payment. It works wonderfully. The next thing I want to talk about is the large edge-to-edge -edge screen that looks crisp and very true to life. It's a very immersive 5.8 inch OLED display. And this is my first time actually using an OLED display on a smartphone. And I gotta say, I'm really impressed. With the screen, blacks are black and there's a great contrast ratio on the phone. Something that I've not been used to after using LCD iPhones in the past. With that being said, there is some subtle blue axis shift and that's just true of basically any OLED panel, but it is not as bad as the Pixel 2 XL in my tests. In conclusion, the screen looks simply amazing and we have Samsung to thank for that. Now we can't talk about the display without addressing the notch. The notch is something that I've gotten used to within a couple hours of owning the phone. There are certain apps that just aren't optimized for that 5.8 inch display. And when they're not optimized, apps feel a little small on the home screen. But other than that, when an app is designed to fully take advantage of the 5.8 inch display, you really won't notice the notch because details about the app or certain elements of the user interface are tucked up into those corners so you don't normally notice it. There is something to be said though about the way that the notch handles video. And in my tests, I've actually been torn between, especially in the YouTube app, whether to pinch to fill the entire screen where the content feels so much more immersive or pinching it back down to the original size to not have this awkward cropping. So it's a difficult kind of comparison between the two modes. When you're watching videos, you can either have a super immersive mode or this uh, more true to life cropped mode. And to be honest, with the OLED screen and the black borders on the sides, you don't notice that it's being cropped as much as you would say on like an LCD screen, but it is noticeable that the video size does decrease. One thing to note about this iPhone is the lack of bezels. And when, especially when I've gone back to looking at other people's phones that have these giant foreheads and chins, I don't know how I did it for so long. This display that takes up basically the entire surface of the phone is something that I've gotten really used to and I think is going to be a great trend going forward in the smartphone world. One thing to note is that with this major design change, Apple had to remove the home button. So what would you do if you wanted to go home? Well, the answer is super simple and it's just swiping up from the bottom. These new gestures that Apple has really implemented are something that doesn't bother me that much anymore. And especially as I mentioned earlier, when I try using the gestures on other people's phones to go home, which is, it just doesn't work. And it feels so much more natural and more intuitive. The really the only thing that took some getting used to for me is the multitasking gesture of pulling up and long pressing, but there's a simple fix for that. And that's just to drag up and swipe to the side at more of a 45 degree angle, and that'll bring up the multitasking window just fine. Another cool gesture that you may not be aware of, but it's also super cool, is being able to just swipe the bottom bar and swipe through apps. That is super cool. It reminds me of the gestures on the iPads where you would just take four fingers and swipe to go through your apps. One other thing to address was with the lack of buttons is how do you summon Siri? Well, there's one of two ways, and the first of which being saying, hey Siri, and it'll trigger your phone. And the second way is to long press the side button. Two things to note about that is that I find myself saying, hey Siri, a lot more than actually pressing and holding down on a physical button. And another thing to notice about the actual physical button is the physical button is also longer. So it's easier to press and it feels a lot more tactile, at least with the case that I have on my phone. Moving on from the screen to another topic of interest is battery life. And battery life on this phone has been probably the best battery life I've ever had on an iOS device. I've had incredible battery life with this phone with 14 hours standby times and six hours of screen on time, with even that having 50% battery left by the end of the day. And again, this varies with your use case about what you're using different apps. 
I'm a pretty light phone user since I have a lot of devices to spread out my battery usage on, but for me personally, I have yet to be able to kill this phone in a single day. When addressing battery life with this phone, you have to address how do you charge the phone. And with the iPhone 10, Apple added wireless charging and fast charging. The only thing being, I haven't had a chance to try out both of them because to enable fast charging, you have to basically spend $60 on a brand new power brick and a brand new power cord in order to get it to work. Um, so I haven't done that, or I haven't done any of the wireless charging stuff working on getting some wireless charging pads for our apartment project, which you can find more info about up here in the corner somewhere, but we'll be working on getting all that tested out very soon. Moving on to the probably one of the most important reasons that you would buy a smartphone is the camera. The camera on this phone was a huge step up for my 6S Plus, and I'm very happy with it. That's the short of it. The long of it is, is that the portrait mode, which I hadn't had on my 6S Plus that I had now, is better on the rear facing camera than it is on the front facing camera. Don't know why that is because Apple has the hardware to do it on the front and they also have the hardware to do it on the back, but maybe in a software update we can get a better portrait mode, but portrait mode for me is something that really stood out to me as being you know, phenomenal while coming from an older generation iPhone. The low light on this camera is awesome with the dual optically stabilized lenses and 4K at 60 FPS is something that not even this A7S camera that I'm shooting on is even capable of. So that is a big, big win for me. Now, another thing that Apple added in this new kind of camera system is portrait lighting. It's featured on the 8, the 8 Plus, and the 10. It's really a gimmick to me. I haven't really used it and I don't really have a use case for it. If I'm gonna be editing my pictures, I'm gonna put them in post and put them in Lightroom, do something with them there. I really have no use for it. Now, one other thing the front facing camera can do is, you guessed it, Animojis. They are pretty cool and a little bit more addicting to send than I would like to admit. However, it's not a make or break deal for you to buy this phone based off the Animoji. Moving on to performance. Performance is fast. There is no frame lag and it works like it's supposed to. I've been particularly able to take advantage of the new processing capabilities on this phone in the new AR kit app. Um, as you may know, I'm moving into a new apartment um, in actually a couple weeks. And I've been able to use the IKEA Place app with their awesome new AR features to be able to virtually place furniture in and around my house and kind of figure out what size furniture fits where. And it's been something that I really enjoyed being able to use. Now talking about games, I'm not really much of a gamer, but I have downloaded one app called Grid Racing and it's been able to handle that exceptionally well. This was a console game that got ported over to the iPhone and this processor really just handles it like a champ. I believe that there's a lot that this A11 Bionic chip is capable of, and we won't know its full power until more software updates come about, or software is written to take full advantage of the processing power that is available for it. Moving on to our final segment of this review is iOS, and love it or hate it, iOS is iOS. I use it, I like it, it's very simple for me, it doesn't require a lot of effort to use, and I don't mind not being able to customize my phone because I have looked at John's Android phone, who is, um, we also did a Pixel XL 2 review, um, shameless plug, but I mean, I just like the way iOS works. It's simple. It gets what I need to get done without a lot of digging through menus and all that kind of stuff. But that, with that being said, it does have its quirks and it still has this really poor notification management when you drag down being able to like, it's just a giant mess there. It's Apple needs to do something about that. One thing about iOS 11 that I found is really cool is the new screenshot management. When you take a screenshot, it kind of shrinks down to the corner and allows you to do what you need to do and then get rid of it so this way the pictures don't clutter up your camera roll. Another thing I've noticed with Siri and iOS 11 is that it is quicker and does more things, but still falls behind to Google's Assistant. It's the end of this review and you may be asking yourself the elephant in the room question of, is this phone worth the thousand dollar price tag? The answer to that question is actually, I think depends on a few things. Number one, can you actually afford it? And number two, what do you expect out of a smartphone? Essentially, I made the decision to go with this phone because of the beautiful display, the power and the performance I could get from this phone and the way that it could integrate into my Apple ecosystem where everything syncs nicely together. If you're looking for something cheaper, the 8 Plus is a great option with many of the same features for less money. Additionally, if you're immersed in the Google and Microsoft ecosystem, this may not be a good fit for you. At this point, there's really so many great smartphones out there on the market that if you were to choose one, you'd be almost guaranteed to have a good experience. I'd just say an advice is to find out what your needs are and then find a phone that best fits those needs. And that's about it for this review. Um, if you have any comments for me about the iPhone 10 that I didn't get to this video, be sure to leave a comment or tweet us at CollegiateTechYT and I'd love to be able to answer those for you. Um, there's buttons down below to subscribe and like, you know what to do with those. Um, this has been Michael from Collegiate Tech, and I will see you guys in the next video.